many people go Many people go to church and many people say they know about Jesus and they know that what Jesus did for them, then why do they still have sin in their heart? 
many Christians all over the world. They're trying to stop sinning. They're trying to please God through their diligence, their sincerity. Okay, next time I'm gonna try harder. Next time I'm not gonna sin anymore. Next time I shouldn't lie anymore. Next time I'm gonna read the Bible more. Next time I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, God, please help me. And they pray and they cry and they beg, but then the same results happen. Jesus Christ dying and paying for my sin. And when we do that, we can know that we are eternally redeemed. Because God fulfilled that eternal redemption through Jesus Christ in the tabernacle that is in heaven, that means the power of Jesus' blood in heaven will last forever. Because in heaven, everything is eternal. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me once again for our final session of the Gospel class here at the Christian Leaders Fellowship World Conference. It has truly been a huge grace that I have received to be able to deliver the Gospel uh, to all of you. You know, I'm not a person who's a great pastor. I'm definitely not a great speaker. But I have received the precious gift of God, the 100% grace to know that my spiritual life had been wrong for so many years. I've been to many churches, Pentecostal, full gospel, non-denominational, and I searched for this truth for many years. But it wasn't until I was able to listen to Pastor Oakshu Park's uh, gospel class when I was 16 years old, when I was able to understand that everything I had known and everything I thought I knew was wrong, and I was able to understand God clearly. And from that moment on, my heart completely changed. I didn't try hard to change, and I didn't have a dream to be a pastor. But when the gospel entered my heart, God led my life. And when God led my life, He led me to live a life that I never desired, that I never thought I wanted. However, as God changed my heart, as God allowed this difficulty, that experience to happen in my life, what I could clearly see is that God began to change my life. So when I think about how God is leading us and God is working through us, I cannot be more thankful about the grace I have received to have received this precious salvation. And that is why I'm so happy to be able to share the gospel that God has shown me with all of you during this world conference. Well, we're going to continue again once again today. We're going to continue. We're going to read from John chapter 4. Today I'm going to start from verse 25, and we're going to skip a little bit and read from another section. But today I want to start with John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 25 through 30 first. Then I want to skip down to verses 39 through 42. John chapter 4, starting from verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come! See a man which told me all things ever, that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now again, we're going to skip to verse 39, and we're going to read to verse 42. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto this woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Wow! Everyone, this is a very amazing story about salvation. But the beautiful thing is this is not a story about the Samaritan woman. This is a story about you and I. Our salvation, her salvation was accomplished by Jesus. Our salvation is exactly identical to this woman. How we heard about it is unique to us, right? Our path is different than this lady's path. But the salvation that this woman received is identical 
to the same salvation that we received. First of all, we were all dirty, filthy people, and we never deserved it, nor will we ever deserve this precious salvation. It is 100% by grace. Secondly, I want to talk about how this woman changed. And when I talk about how this woman changed, I want to talk about exactly, you know, first I want to talk about the change, and then I want to talk about how this change was possible. Okay? This woman went. Now, this woman was gathering water. What time was it? Let's look here. Let's look at verse, uh, verse, okay, 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied, with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now, here Jesus is at the well. There's nobody else there. She's drawing her water at the sixth hour. Now, in Jewish time, 6 a.m. was zero time. So their day begins at 6 a.m. So the sixth hour would be around noon. So what does this mean? What this means is most of the women, I remember when I was young, I lived in a, you know, I was in Korea and I would see a lot of times the old Korean grandmothers, they would go to like a, a small creek or something and they would do the hand washing and then they would draw water and stuff like that to do the laundry. But everyone, when you draw water from a well, the best time to draw water is early in the morning. Why? Because that is when the water is cool. That is when the water is the freshest. So what happens, most people would draw the water in the morning because you need it for cooking in the morning and you draw the water that you need, all the water you need in the morning and then you can use it throughout the day. But here, this woman went to the well during the hottest part of the day, which is noon, the hottest part of the day, the sixth hour, the time where she knew nobody was going to be there. Why did she draw water that way? Very simple, because she knew that everybody in that village knew who she was. Everyone knew that this was the woman who had six husbands. This is that dirty, filthy woman that married all of those men. And she was so sick and tired of people whispering about her, pointing their fingers at her, talking about her behind her back, judging her, and she could feel it. So she was so ashamed even of her own life. She was so embarrassed, so ashamed of the sins that she committed that she would draw the water during the sixth hour when she knew nobody would be there. And so she was so shocked when she saw Jesus because she expected nobody to be there. Well, Jesus met with her. Now, if you look at how this woman changed, it is weird. It is so amazing, actually. I say it's weird because it's different than human logic. It's completely outside of human way of thinking. How this woman changed could only be done by God. And I want to talk about this. Because we as pastors, when we preach the gospel, when we're doing a con leading a congregation, the important thing is that our congregation needs to change. They cannot change by my wisdom. They don't change by my folk stories. They don't change about like how I interpret things. They change when they meet the heart of God. So this woman changed so much when she met Jesus. How did she change? Let's take a look here, verse 27, uh, verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then we go to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. Everyone, this woman has completely changed. At first, she was so ashamed of her sin. She was so ashamed of the things that she'd done, she couldn't even show her face in front of other people at the time where they were drawing water from the well. She had to go to the well when nobody was there. But now she's going door to door, talking to everybody. And how does she introduce Jesus? It's so amazing. But the way she introduces Jesus is she says, Hey, I met the Messiah. I met a man. We met for the first time, but he knew I had six husbands, everyone. He knew everything I did in my life. He knew about all five of the other husbands that I divorced, and he knew about the sixth one. Can you believe it? She's talking about it as if it were nothing. Why is that? Because this woman, she changed. How did she change? Let's talk about this. I told you, right? <clears throat> the Bible talks about the heart of God. When you know the heart of God, and if you know clearly what God's heart is towards me, you can have faith. Am I right, everyone? So now think about it. Let's go to John chapter 8. Now this is going to happen a few chapters later. 
but because we have a Bible, we have the ability to look into the future, right? So we're going to go to John chapter 8 and see God's heart towards another woman. Let's look here. <clears throat> Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Everyone, in Jesus' heart, this woman who had just committed adultery, there was no condemnation in Jesus' heart. Now let's talk about this. Now for those people who are still tied up with future sin, I want to break down something down for you, okay? John chapter 1 was after Jesus received the hands-on for his baptism from John the Baptist. Now, when he, John the Baptist did the hands-on laying on of hands of Jesus, all the sin of the world passed over onto Jesus. Am I right? Now, that's John chapter 1. This woman committed adultery in John chapter 8. So, did this woman commit adultery before or after he received the hands-on? After he received the hands-on. Am I right? That's right. All the sin of the world had passed over onto Jesus. So when Jesus met this woman taken in adultery, her sin had already passed over onto Jesus. And that is why Jesus could not say, you are a sinner. Jesus told her what? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now what does that mean? Neither, I can't condemn you. Why? Because all your sins have already passed over onto me. Now, Live a life free from sin. That's exactly what he's telling you. So, for example, if I give my son, let's say, you know, my son is 17 right now. Let's say it probably won't happen because I don't have that much money. But let's say by some miracle I win the lottery and I buy my son a car. It's not going to happen, but let's say I buy my son a car. When I buy my son a car, I'll give him the car keys. And when I give him the car keys, I'm going to say, hey, son, drive it. But also I want you to have fun is me saying, hey, drive it. Have fun. Is that a commandment? No. That's saying, hey, enjoy the freedom that I gave you. Jesus is saying, neither do I condemn you. There is no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation? Because there's no more sin to condemn. Now, sin no more. Enjoy your life free from sin. Enjoy your life free from condemnation. You have been freed by me. So all of her sin had already passed over unto Jesus. Did she confess her sin? No, she didn't. Did she ask Jesus to forgive her? No, she didn't. In fact, she didn't even say one single word. Jesus already forgave her. Why? Because Jesus was already carrying her sin. Yes, the sin that she had not committed yet. And when she did commit the sin, and when they brought her to Jesus, she didn't even know. But then Jesus made it clear, neither do I condemn you. God does not condemn you, child. God has no condemnation towards you. Why? Because all your sin has been passed over unto Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is no more condemnation. And then when you look at Jesus being crucified, what does it say? That when Jesus was carrying his cross, people spat on him. People cursed him, pointed their finger at him, tore his beard, punched his face, despised him. And right? Why? Jesus took all our shame upon himself as well. There is no need to be ashamed in Jesus Christ for our sin because our sin has been washed completely by the blood of Jesus. Everyone, this woman, this Samaritan woman met this Jesus. Now look at her heart. Before she was so ashamed of having married six husbands. She was so ashamed of her sinful last, a past. She was so ashamed of the sinful life she's even living now. She was so embarrassed, so embarrassed that she could not show her face at the time where other women would gather water. She had to go to the well when nobody was there. That's how shameful she used to be. But now look at her. She's walking around talking about her six husbands as if it were nothing. She's walking around talking about, hey, look, this man knew everything that I did in the past. What does this mean? She was a sinner. Now she is righteous. Amen. That change happened. Now what is that change? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. 
I'm going to read verse 17. No, actually, first I'm going to read verse 16. Verse 16 and 17, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What does it say? The old creature is passed away, everyone. What's another way of dead? What's another way of saying dead? To pass away, right? If I die, oh, he passed away. He passed away. Passed away. The old creature. The old things are all passed away. Amen? Now I am a new creature. Now I am born again. This is what it means to be born again, everyone. This woman in her past, she committed so many sins, filled with so much lust, marrying one man after another man. Did you know, according to the law, if a woman divorces a man and remarries, if it wasn't for adultery, if the man did not commit adultery, and the man is still alive, if she marries a new man, then that man is considered adultery. That marriage is considered adultery. If her husband dies and she's a widow, <clears throat> then she is free to marry another man. <clears throat> but if she divorces him, if it's just a divorce and he didn't commit adultery, they just irreconcilable differences, they just decided to divorce. If she marries another man, that is adultery, everyone. That is not a, a valid marriage. That is adultery. So what does this mean, everyone? If you look here, this woman had committed adultery. I don't know if all five of her previous husbands had died, but she's married to a sixth husband right now. So her whole life was filled with adultery, with lust, with desire, with envy, with coveting. And I know she's lied before, and we definitely know she committed adultery. And we definitely know maybe she's even, I'm pretty sure she stole something once in her life. If you think about it, even if you don't physically steal, even if you do desire to steal in your heart, you've already stole according to God. So we know that this woman lived a, such a sinful life. But now she's talking to people as if that doesn't matter anymore. She's talking about it as if that's something that's dead and gone. That old me, those old actions, they're dead. They're done. There's nothing, there's nothing about that person does not exist anymore. I am a new creature. When she met Jesus and Jesus' heart entered into her, that changed this woman to believe in this truth. I have already been made different. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Everyone, that gospel, that Jesus that she met, that words of Jesus entered her heart and changed and flipped her whole life perception. In God's heart, in Jesus' heart, she's already washed. In Jesus' heart, Jesus is con her condemnation has already passed over onto Jesus. In Jesus' heart and in God's heart, the record for her sin was already washed. Now, she was washed clean and righteous in God's heart, and now she's also washed and clean in Jesus' heart. But most importantly, the fact that she could talk so freely about her past, talk so freely about her sin, is because now she has the faith that she is not a sinner anymore. That's not her. She's a new creature. Now, in God's heart, she's a new creature. In God, Jesus' heart, she's a new creature. In the Word of God, she's a new creature. And now, in her heart, she's a new creature. And that is what changed her. The heart of God clearly entered her heart. Now, she didn't try hard to become a new creature. She just believed in the fact that God made her a new creature. She believed the promise. The promise that God has made her a new creature. Amen, everyone? Everyone, this is amazing. Why are we struggling to try to become new? Why are we struggling to try to change ourselves? Just like Romans chapter 10 says, Why are people trying to establish their own righteousness? Because they are ignorant of God's righteousness. God has already given us His righteousness. And in fact, He's already made us a new creature. How do we know? The proof is in the promise. The Word of God. So everyone, this woman completely changed. Now, 
This is another amazing thing. She's knocking door to door of the town where everybody knows her. Am I right? Everybody knows her. That's why she's in the sixth hour. She doesn't want to get her finger pointed at her because everybody knows that that's that woman that married six husband. But guess what? When she knocked on the door and she said, Hey, everyone, the Messiah met me. I met the Messiah. I met the Son of God, the Savior. He met me. Nobody said, well, who are you? Yeah, right. Why would the Messiah meet you? Get out of, hey, don't touch my door with your dirty fingers. You little dirty, you know, tramp. You dirty, lustful person. You adulterer. Don't touch me. Get away from my house. Nobody rejected her. What does the Bible say? The whole town listened to her. The whole town came out and met Jesus. And you know what that means? In God's heart, she's a new creature. She's not a sinner. She's a new creature. In Jesus' heart, she's not a sinner. She's made a new creature. And in her heart, she's not a sinner. She's made a new creature. And guess what, everyone? In everybody else's eyes, she's not a sinner anymore. She's a new creature. Isn't that amazing? That is the powerful word of God. Everyone, even if you could change yourself, how much could you possibly change? I can't change everybody's heart. I can have enough problems changing my own heart. <laughs> How am I supposed to change Jesus' heart, God's heart, all the people's hearts, and my own heart? I can't do it. But God, He changed everybody's heart. In everybody's heart, she is no longer a adulterous woman marrying six husbands. She's a new creature. She is the messenger of God. She is a child of God. She has been born of the Spirit now, everyone. She is covered in the blood of Jesus. And because that reality, because that faith, because that promise entered into her heart, that Word of God created a faith that holds her heart. Most Christians also are very misinformed when it comes to faith. They believe that faith is them maintaining the, the confidence in their heart, them holding on to the promise. Everyone, you cannot hold on to the promise. You know, there was a story once in South Korea. In South Korea, they have a lot of apartments. And a lot of times these apartments are like 20 stories high. Some are 30 floors high. So what happens is, one time there was a fire that started in the middle of an apartment and it was going upward. As you know, fires go up. So the people who were trapped on the upper floors, they had no way to go down. So what they did was they climbed to the roof of the apartment. But because the apartment is like 20 stories high, the fireman's ladder does not reach that high. So what happened? They came up with a plan. Hey, if we have a helicopter, let's fly a helicopter and pick up the people. So what we'll do is we'll hang two ropes on the side of the helicopter. And many people will grab the rope and what we'll do is we'll fly them off the roof and go, it's just one block over. Just one block over, there's a big soccer field of a high school. Of a high school in that area, we'll just lower them down into the high school. It's a good idea, right? Very simple idea. We'll fly just right down. They'll grab the rope and we'll just literally lower them, like an elevator. We'll just lower them down into the field on the next block. However, there was a problem. Have you ever been under a helicopter? Do you know how strong the helicopter blades, the force of the air under a helicopter actually is. When you watch movies, you see all these men like, and the wind's blowing and they can't even look at it, right? It's really hard. But now you don't have soldiers, you have housewives, women who don't take physical training. You have little kids holding onto a rope with the force of a moving helicopter plus the blades pushing down on them and they have to hold their whole body weight while moving. It was impossible. The idea was good, the rope didn't break, the helicopter didn't crash, but the people's hands were too weak to hold it. So they, many of them died trying to be saved by the helicopter. Everyone, if you're trying to change yourself, it's not going to work. Why? It's not that you lack the effort or the desire. You can't change yourself because you're too weak. How much can you actually change? You can't change people's hearts, you can't change God's heart. God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Nobody can change God's heart. You're not powerful enough. You're not righteous enough, and you're not good enough. 
but we don't need to because God has already proposed his heart, everyone. God already sent Jesus for you and for me. Whether you believe it or not, God was sent, God sent Jesus to take your sin upon Jesus. God removed the sin of the world and placed it upon Jesus Christ. So everyone, what does this mean? God has, in God's heart, you are already righteous. In God's heart, you are holy. In God's heart, He has forgiven you. You are a new creature. The old you is past. There is no more Pastor Terry. The old me has died on the cross. Now, there is only Jesus Christ. And when that gospel was able to enter my heart, that was when I was able to be free from sin myself. The Samaritan woman, she changed. The Samaritan woman was no longer a sinner, no longer an adulterous, filthy woman who married six husbands. The woman was now a righteous child of God. Everyone, this is very, very important. Not only was she a righteous child of God in God's heart, but she was also righteous and forgiven and redeemed in Jesus' heart. And then when she met Jesus, what happened? Through conversation with Jesus, through listening to the words of Jesus, the image of that woman transferred from Jesus' heart to the woman's heart. The same thing happened to the woman taken in adultery. Jesus had already received her sin, and therefore by receiving her sin, he also received the condemnation that was supposed to go to her, has now already passed over onto Jesus. So then when Jesus met this woman taken in adultery, he had no choice. There was nothing more he could say. Neither do I condemn you. God doesn't condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Why? Because all your condemnation is upon me. And when she was able to discover that, how thankful she was. She didn't defeat sin on her own. She didn't try hard to struggle to stop sin, to stop the desire of sin. All she did was accept the truth, accept the promise that we are new creatures, accept the reality that Jesus has already made us new creatures. Does that mean that the woman taking adultery never looked at another man and thought he was handsome? Does that mean that the woman taking in adultery after she met Jesus, she never lied again? Does that mean this, this Samaritan woman, she never stole anything? She never got angry again? She never hated someone again? Of course not. As long as she's in this flesh, she will have sin come out of her. But she knows without a beyond a reasonable doubt that all my sins have been passed over unto Jesus Christ. All the condemnation has passed over unto Jesus Christ. And I am a new creature. Behold, all things are become new. So let's take a look at a few more places in the Bible to kind of confirm that. Now, last yesterday, what we talked about was through the sin offering. Now, the law provides that through the sin offering that was given at the tabernacle, at the temple, that is how we, our sins are forgiven. The wages of sin or death are paid, and then we become redeemed. However, we're going to take a little bit deeper look at how this woman was able to change. So now we know what change she experienced. Now we're going to talk about how that change was possible. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, everyone. Hebrews chapter 9 reads, <clears throat> we're going to read starting from verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now what does it say here? It says that there is two tabernacles. And I told you about this. Mo Moses made the tabernacle a model after what he saw in heaven. So there is a tabernacle. There is an eternal heaven, a temple in heaven, everyone. So Moses made the tabernacle as it looked, as God revealed it to him in heaven. He made an, a sample of it on earth. So if you look here, that Jesus Christ, He didn't wash our sins away at the tabernacle on earth. Where does it say, verse 11, But Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. That means a tabernacle not made with hands. A tabernacle that's not like this building one, not the one that Moses built. The real tabernacle, which is in heaven. Now why is this important? Heaven is an eternal world. And in heaven, 
everything is eternal. Which means if I wash your sin here on earth, that is why the lambs that, that were offered during Moses' tab tabernacle, it had to be offered again and again and again. So the individual lamb had to be offered the next day because the blood of the lamb that was shed today does not wash away the sin of your, of your tomorrow. And then the sin offering that washed away your sin for an entire year had to be redone because you sin again the year after that. So we could see that there was always a temporal, temporal uh, quality to these offerings. And that is why God had to establish the tabernacle in heaven. Now in heaven, there is no past, there is no present, and there is no future. There is no time. It's a realm that exists above time. It's an eternal realm. And it is in that eternal realm that Jesus obtained eternal redemption for us. So how did God redeem us? He redeemed us eternally, everyone. So when Jesus says that you are redeemed, these are not empty words. These are supported by what Jesus actually did. These are words confirmed by what Jesus actually did for us. Jesus took his own blood, entered into the tabernacle that is in heaven, and sprinkled his blood before the mercy seat in heaven where God sits. And it is there that God wants to meet us. So God wants to meet us on the mercy seat, the mercy that we have received through Jesus Christ dying and paying for my sin. And when we do that, we can know that we are eternally redeemed because God fulfilled that eternal redemption through Jesus Christ in the tabernacle that is in heaven. That means the power of Jesus' blood in heaven will last forever because in heaven, everything is eternal. So that is why the change is possible. Everyone, your sin has been eternally washed, eternally cleansed. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus. Now we're going to talk a little bit more deeper about this as well. Okay, let's take a look here. Hebrews chapter 10, the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read verse 1 here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So this is exactly what we're talking about. So the law, Moses' law, the tabernacle made according to the law, was a shadow of the good thing to come. A shadow is not the image. It's not the actual thing. It's a small, like kind of like image of it. It's like the, the frame of it. It's not the actual thing. It's not the substance of the actual thing. The actual thing that God was revealing through the model, through the shadow of the tabernacle that Moses made, was the real tabernacle that is in heaven. Now we're going to keep reading. <clears throat> what we're going to say is, in verse 9, then said he, this is Jesus, Then said Jesus, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus takes away the first, that he may establish the second. So the first covenant was ended through Jesus Christ, and he established the new one, the second one, right? And here we go. We're going to talk about this. Verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Everyone, what does this mean? Jesus sanctified us. Jesus removed our sin. And through Jesus' offering, we have been sanctified once and for all. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So Jesus sat down on the right hand of God, giving one offering for sins forever ever everyone so our sins were paid for they were redeemed forever so he eliminated the first he finished the first covenant remember i told you jesus fulfilled the law for us by jesus fulfilling the law for us he now is establishing a new covenant now what is that new covenant let's take a look here <clears throat> now let's look here verse 16 this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now this is the new covenant, right? Now where does this, though? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 and 17 talks about the new covenant, right? And this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. After those days, after Jesus' days, after Jesus' crucifixion, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. 
And just like I told you, now the difference is God doesn't give us a separate law on two tablets of stone and tells us, hey, do it. This time God says, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write them in their hearts. What does this mean? Now I will give you my heart. Now my heart will be your heart. The woman, the Samaritan woman, how did she change? Let's talk about this. First, in order to understand this, I'm going to walk you through the process. I want to look at Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. What does it say here? Okay, so when you have sinned, we are separated from God. God cannot help us. God will not help us. God cannot hear us. He will not hear us because of the sin. Because of sin, we have been separated from God. God cannot dwell with sin. Everybody understand? So we're good so far, right? So we cannot receive the Holy Spirit. We cannot receive the heart of God if we have sin. Our sin has to be washed first. Well, guess what, everyone? Jesus washed our sin away. And when Jesus washed our sin away, now the sin has been removed. Am I right? Now that the sin has been removed, there is nothing blocking God and us any longer. And this is proven in Romans chapter 8. So in Romans chapter 8, God confirms this. Romans chapter 8. What does it say here? Let's look at Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> it says right here, uh, starting from verse 31. Romans chapter 8, starting from verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. What shall we lay to the chain charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And if you look here, verse 39, Neither height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the sin that separated us, that sin has been removed forever. Now, there is nothing that blocks God in us. What can separate me from the love of God? Nothing. Not anymore, because my sin has been removed. And because there is no more blockage of sin, so God and us are open now. Now God can come to us, and we can come to God. And that is why with the new covenant, by Jesus removing our sin, now He opened the way for the new covenant to be possible. And that new covenant means, now my heart can flow into your heart. Now my heart will be your heart. I will work from heart to heart. I will give you my heart. I will not just give you two separate tablets of stone and say, hey, you do this on your own because you had sin back then. And because you had sin, I could not be with you. That's why God had to make the tabernacle in the first place. God had to establish the tabernacle because God wanted to be with man. But if God is with man and man has sin, God will kill man. Man has to die. If man has sin and stands in front of God, they will die. But God wanted to dwell among them. So God created something called the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, he established the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was a lid. The covering of the lid was called the mercy seat. And that was where God would sit and there he would meet with us so that God could dwell among the people. But everyone, Jesus fulfilled our eternal redemption, everyone. There is no more sin any, anymore. So when Jesus died, what happened? It says the veil, the veil that blocked the most holy place, it tore from the top to the bottom. It tore completely in half. Now the veil is open. There is no more veil. The veil was established in the tabernacle so that if anyone who has sin enters into the most holy place, that person would die because he's standing in the presence of God. But now there is no more need for the veil. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil tore. And because the veil tore, there is no more sin. So therefore, there is nothing that needs to block God from coming to us. Now God is able to freely enter into our heart. Now the way that God chose to work this time is, you are not going to take care of yourself. You are not going to try to stop sinning. You are not going to lead your own life. But now my heart will enter into your heart. So when this woman, this Samaritan woman met Jesus, the image 
that Jesus had of this woman that was in his heart because in Jesus' heart, she's already a new creature. In Jesus' heart, there is no more condemnation. In Jesus' heart, she is no longer an adulterous woman. She is a child of God. She is righteous. She is free from sin. So through the conversation that she had with Jesus, the heart of Jesus entered into this woman's heart. The image that Jesus had in, of this woman entered into her heart. But look at you right now, everyone. I want you to look into your heart. Do you see yourself as a sinner or do you see yourself as righteous? Do you see yourself as free from condemnation or do you see yourself as I am a sinner, therefore I have to, have, I have to be condemned? Everyone, if you see yourself as a sinner, that is clearly stating that the heart and the image that Jesus have of you in his heart has not entered your heart. So the new covenant is, I am not just going to give you two tablets of stone and say, you do this and you don't do that. You try this, and, but don't do that. I'm not going to do that. You are not on your own anymore because you failed. Why would God try the same method twice? You, he gave you the law and he told you what to do and what not to do. Nobody could do it. Nobody could do it. <clears throat> so then why would God make the same mistake and leave it to you again? God is not foolish. God knows that if I do the same method, you're going to fail again. And then Jesus has to die again. So that's why God established a new covenant. And in that new covenant, he says, I will put my heart into your heart. I will write my heart into your heart. And how does that work? <clears throat> Just like the Samaritan woman listened to the words of Jesus, when she listened to the words of Jesus, the hope, the forgiveness, the righteousness that was in Jesus' heart, just transferred into her heart. You know, they say that <clears throat> a child, you know, they, 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 they kind of look like their mother. They look like their father, right? But they don't just look like them, but they also act like them. Why? Because when they grow up, <clears throat> they see their father, they see their mother, and they see what the habits that they do. They see the way they talk. And that's why a lot of times the children talk like the parents. Because that's who they learned how to talk from. That's who they saw every day. And they modeled themselves after their parents. Everyone, when we were born in this world, the only image of ourselves that we've seen was the image of a sinner. We talk like a sinner. We thought like a sinner. Our standards are that of a sinner. Our standard is that of a human sinner who cannot see the spiritual world. Therefore, every standard we have based in our life has never been based on the spiritual world. We based it on the world that we knew. So we grew up imitating the flesh. We grew up with the standards of the flesh of sin in our heart. Now when God gives us the word of God, it is very difficult. It actually is impossible for that to become my new standard unless, unless I deny my heart, unless I repent, forsake my thought, realize that my thought is wrong, my standard is incorrect. Let God be true and every man a liar. Oh, Jesus says, I am righteous, everyone. So when Jesus looks at me, because Jesus died on the cross, because Jesus went to heaven and in the most holy place presented his own blood, not the blood of a, blood of a goat, not the blood of a calf or you know, a cow or a sheep, but with his own holy, eternal blood, Jesus washed our sin. And the new covenant is, now that there's no sin to block me and you, that means now I hear your prayer. Now I will listen to your prayer. Those who accept the gospel by faith, when you are righteous, if you accept that Jesus' blood made you righteous, if you accept that reality, then you are righteous. If you accept that promise that God has made you justified, that God has made you righteous, God has sanctified you, then that promise is in your heart. And then what is the new covenant? It says that, yes, he will write his heart in your heart. And then what does he say? And I will forgive your iniquities and I will remember your sin no more. Everyone, why was this woman going around door to door talking about her past? Because she remembers her sin no more. She remembers her condemnation no more. Why? Because that's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of God. Right? The new covenant says what? I will forgive your iniquities and I will remember your sin no more. God does not remember our sin anymore. Amen? So this woman, this Samaritan woman, was freed from her sin. She was freed from herself. Why? Because herself was nailed to the cross. That faith, 
That faith came from God. It did not come from her. That's what it means. I will write my law in your heart. I will write this new covenant in your heart. Therefore, it comes by faith. Now, it's not that we have to force ourselves to believe it. If we just accept God's heart, God's heart will give us a new heart. God's heart will give us that faith. That's the new covenant. God is going to do it. God is the one that upholds your faith. And that's why the scripture says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, everyone. So the new covenant is not you trying to believe. It's not you trying to change your heart. It's not you trying to propose yourself, okay, this time I'm going to believe. This time I'm going to be better. This time I'm going to change this. This time I'm not going to do that. That's the old covenant. That never worked and it will not work. So God is not going to try the same method twice. We do it, but God is not foolish. God's not going to be doing the same thing when he knows it's not going to work. That's why God placed 100% my salvation, 100% my spiritual life, my change, the change of my heart, me being free from sin, me overcoming sin, me living with a new heart. All of that was placed onto Jesus. That was Jesus' responsibility. And when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Jesus' work is finished. Amen? All the work of Jesus has been fulfilled. And that is why in Acts chapter 3, Jesus says all the prophecies, everything that was written about Jesus, He has fulfilled, everyone. Now, here comes faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Are we going to believe in our eyes? Are we going to believe what we see? Or are we going to believe in the promise of Jesus? Are we going to only believe in the image that I have of myself or am I going to accept the image that God has of me in His heart and accept it exactly as it is? Those are two very, very important things. Now, there's one more thing that I want to talk about. <clears throat> so now we talked about this. Let's talk about, let's go a little bit further here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 10 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Everyone, this is another thing you have to understand. Yes, you've committed sin. That's what it says in verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Translated to simple English, if you have committed sin, you cannot go to heaven. You deserve to go to hell, to be condemned and receive damnation. That is true, and such were some of you. That's right, we have all sinned. Nobody on earth has not sinned. Everybody has sinned. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Everyone, yes, you've committed sin. But there's another powerful word, but. But has the power to erase everything that comes before it and replace it with everything that comes after it. So if I use the word but, and let's say I say something positive. Oh, you know, oh, I'm, such a, I'm, such, I'm so happy right now. And when you hear the word but, if something is positive before the word but, then you know what's coming after, something negative. But if you say something negative and then you hear the word but, now you can change your heart. Now you can have hope because something positive is coming. Am I right? So, yes, we have all sinned and we have all come short of the glory of God, but we are washed. We are sanctified. And we are justified. Everyone, once again, how was this Samaritan woman able to change so much? She changed because now she also in God's heart, this is the Word of God, right? This is the Bible. The Bible says you are washed. The Bible says you are sanctified. The Bible says you are justified. Not Pastor Terry. I'm not the one that's giving you these promises. If I'm the one that's promising you this, you should not believe it. You should turn off your TV and you should go. You should turn off your screen and go. You should turn off the internet and just go. Don't listen to me. But I'm not the one that's telling you you are washed. It is the Word of God. It's the promise of God. God says, but you are washed. You are sanctified, and you are justified, everyone. Amen? It is God's promise. God has washed you, which means in God's heart, this Samaritan woman is washed. 
she is sanctified, she is justified. In Jesus' heart, she is washed, she is sanctified, and she is justified. And finally, when she met Jesus, and when she realized who Jesus was, Jesus is my Savior. And if Jesus is my Savior, and Jesus says, it is finished, that means I am saved. I have been washed, I have been sanctified, and I have been justified. Now, that heart of Jesus was now written in her own heart. And then when she went out witnessing, even more amazing was that in everybody else's heart, she was also washed. She was also sanctified. She was also justified. Everyone, this is, means she truly is no longer a sinner. Everyone, this is the power of the Word of God. The power of the Word of God is very simple. The difference between my words and God's words, God's Word has the power to fulfill itself. It is self-fulfilling. The power of God, words, is powerful enough to create something out of nothing. God created the earth with the Word of God. God made life come from nothing, everyone. The earth was without form and void. and His darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was empty. There's nothing but darkness. Nothing there. But when the Word spoke, mountains formed. Trees came out of nowhere. Life came out of nowhere. That's right. Single cell organisms. Later we saw, you know, fish of the sea, animals of the sea. Later we saw birds. Later we saw you know, four-footed beasts, creeping things, and even human beings. Everyone, the Word of God has the self-sustaining power to fulfill itself and manifest itself and create something from nothing. Our words have no power. So if we are listening to God's Word and that Word does not create faith in me, it's because I'm despising the Word and treating the Word of God as if it were a word of another human being. That is the deception and the distrust that Satan puts in our hearts. But everyone, it's the Word of God. God says you are washed. God says you are sanctified and you are justified. And when this Samaritan woman accepted those words, not only did it actually wash her, she was able to be free from it in her own heart, and in everybody else's heart. In everybody else who knew this woman, who knew exactly how this woman lived, in everybody else's heart, she's now no longer an adulterous sinner. She is also a servant of God. She is the precious daughter of God who preaches the gospel. So they all listened to her. They all followed her. And they all met Jesus. And they all came to believe in themselves. Am I right? So everyone, if you really think about it, now let's talk about this. Let's go back to John chapter 4 and we'll finish. John chapter 4, I want to read verse 42. I'll start from verse 41. And many more believed because of his own words. So Jesus is preaching the gospel, right? So many more people are believing that Jesus, they're believing in Jesus by listening to his sermon. Jesus decided to stay for an extra two days. And for two days, he had Bible seminar. He basically preached the gospel, probably had like a, you know, Christian Leaders Fellowship World Conference there as well. So Pastor you know, Joseph, J Jesus is preaching, and then he's preaching, and now more people believe. In verse 42, what did they say? And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that he, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Everyone, what did this woman realize? This woman realized, finally, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. This entire village realized Jesus is the Savior of the world. But before, he was just a Jew. Before, he was just an angry Jew that would never have anything to do with him. Secondly, he became a prophet. But then finally, finally, in this woman's heart, Jesus became her Savior. And now that Jesus became her Savior, she was free from sin. But if, we, if she's a person who still thinks she's a sinner, if she's a person who still claims, no, I'm a sinner, I still sin. Look, I'm still a sinner. My sin is still there. I'll be a sinner until I die. That is not a person who sees Jesus as their true Savior. That is a person who sees Jesus as a prophet. That is a person who still sees Jesus as a Jew. And Jews have nothing to do with sinners like me. I have to, that's why I have to earn my righteousness. That's why I have to try hard. That's why I have to try to keep the law. These are people who do not know who Jesus is. These are people who do not know what the law was really about. And we studied what the law was about. We studied the purpose of the law. It was very simple. To teach us what God's standard of sin is. And by teaching us what God's standard of sin is, He has cornered every human being. Every human being who has been born on this earth is cornered by the law 
and led by the law to only one option of salvation, that is Jesus Christ. And so how do you fulfill the law? You fulfill the law by believing that Jesus Christ has made you righteous, by accepting Jesus Christ as my eternal Savior, by accepting the truth that through the blood of Jesus, through Jesus fulfilling the first covenant and establishing the second covenant, through Jesus not missing one sin, having received upon Him all the sin of the world and entering into the most holy place according to God's law, according to God's standard, perfectly redeemed my sin forever. So what is truly fulfilling the law? When God talks about thou shalt keep my law, that means to believe that Jesus has made me righteous, to believe that I have been cleansed and forgiven by the precious blood of Jesus, to know that my sin has been eternally washed in the tabernacle, in the temple that is in heaven, the same temple that Moses looked at when he made it on earth. And you know, when you look at the Bible, right before Jesus died, right before Jesus died, <clears throat> what does it say? Jesus went on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And there he talked with Elijah. And he talked with who? Moses. So Moses knew of Jesus. Moses talked about Jesus. Yeah, it doesn't say the name Jesus in any of the books that Moses wrote. But it says on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus met with Moses and Jesus met with Elijah. Why? Because this signifies that Jesus has fulfilled the law and Jesus has fulfilled the prophecies, the prophets. Jesus fulfilled the prophets and the law, everyone. This is amazing. That means the law truly was a shadow of the Messiah, the Savior who would come and wash the sins of the world eternally. Jesus was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. So even in the Old Testament, even during the times of the kings, God was prophesying about Jesus. King David prophesied about Shiloh, prophesied about Jesus in Psalms. And what else? Ezekiel, everybody. All the prophets prophesied about Jesus. Jeremiah, he prophesied and he listed the new covenant. So what we read in Hebrews chapter 10, this is the new covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. That was actually written originally in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. So it was requoted in the book of Hebrews. But actually the original New Covenant was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah in his book, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. So all the prophecies, Jesus perfectly fulfilled them. Every requirement of the law, Jesus perfectly kept it. Everyone, to keep the law and please God, is for us to say we are sinners and stop trying to change our sin, but accept the reality that we are sinners and there's nothing we can do for sin. So let us stand in front of the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. That is keeping the law. When I sin, I give the sin offering. I have sinned all my life. You have sinned all your life. So now we must give the sin offering. We must accept the sin offering, which is... Jesus Christ, the eternal sin offering that has given us eternal redemption. Everyone, if we know God's heart, it's very easy to have faith. In this woman, the Samaritan woman's heart, Jesus became the Savior of the world. And then what happened? She witnessed to the whole village. And eventually, in the people's hearts of the village, Jesus also became the Savior of the world. I hope that you will be pastors, that you will be church leaders, that will be able to deliver to all your congregation, to your family members, to whoever you meet, the true image of Jesus being the Savior of the world. And this means to truly accept the truth, the reality, and the promise that we have been made righteous, that we have been washed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified, and we have been redeemed eternally by the perfect blood of Jesus by the holy blood of Jesus in the eternal tabernacle in heaven. And therefore, I am washed, forgiven, and righteous eternally. And I hope that this faith will enter your heart 
And if this faith enters your heart exactly as it is, then just like the Samaritan woman, even though you don't try to change, try hard to change yourself, but God will write His heart into your hearts. God will write His laws into your heart, and then you will be like God. And then God will show you His image. God will show you the image He has of you in your heart. So your heart and God's heart will be looking at the same thing. We'll be thinking the same thing. Oh, I'm righteous. And then when you preach this true image of Jesus, then everybody will also come to know that Jesus is their true Savior. And then you will be true preachers of the eternal gospel of God. So I hope that you will receive this grace and live as servants of God by faith in the word and the promise alone, in the blood of Jesus alone, and deliver this powerful only solution to sin to all your congregation members. Thank you so much for joining us, and I thank you for joining this gospel class and listening to the Word. So I hope that we, we will be blessed <clears throat> in your ministry, and thank you so much for joining us here at the CLF World Conference. So I will pray, and we'll finish. Dear God, we truly thank you for blessing all of us with this precious gospel. Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, he didn't, he didn't have to come. If He chose not to come, we would just all end up being you know, condemned and living a life of destruction and eventually ending up in eternal hellfire. But God, because You loved us, because Jesus loved us, Jesus was, You sent Jesus to this earth. And when He died on the cross for our sins, He completely removed all of our sins and, er, and created and fulfilled and earned the perfect salvation for all of us. So Lord, let us accept this by faith. Let us deny our thoughts, our experiences. Let us throw everything down and completely commit myself, commit ourselves into the promise. And if the promise fails, so be it. But if I die, I die. But I will die following the Lord God. So we ask that you give us that heart to surrender everything to the promise of God. God, you said I'm righteous, so I'm going to accept that I'm righteous, no matter what I see, no matter what I experience, no matter what I feel, and no matter what I think, and especially no matter what Satan tells me. Lord, let these pastors, ministers, church leaders, church members, congregation members, youth, whoever is listening, Lord, let them accept this same faith into their hearts, and just as you changed this Samaritan woman, and just as you made her free from her past, free from her sin, and just as you made that faith that she is a new creature arise in her heart and lead her heart to be a powerful preacher of this gospel and that saved thousands of people, Lord, please work powerfully through these precious Christian leaders, pastors, and you know, servants that you have called. Let them preach this powerful gospel. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again next time.